Hello. Thank you for coming out to uh, see uh, Fast Pinball and Mission Pinball uh, show off what we've been working on with uh, tools and software to create uh, new pinball games. We're waiting right now for uh, Gabe Knuth with Mission Pinball, who's in route here right now after a couple flight delays. So um, if somebody comes rushing in, in the middle of this, we're fully aware of it. We know who he is, and he's got stuff to contribute. Um, so I'm Aaron Davis, and uh, Dave Beecher and I. I'm Dave Beecher. We've been uh, working mm -hmm. for probably a couple of years now on, on uh, our fast pinball hardware. And what we got in here actually is um, stuff back from actual production. And it's kind of a big, exciting time for uh, showing off what we've done. Um, should we dig into our, our slide deck? Um, what was the command for advancing the slide? There we go. Um, so part of our, our, our goal for uh, producing the, the fast pinball hardware was to create a, a platform to develop on. Um, where we can get like a good solid baseline for um, all the required pinball resources, you know, firing coils, reading switches, all those things, but also find a good basis for bringing new technology into pinball. Um, the, you know, maybe it's where our fast name came from, but part of our goal was to get people, like designers, up on top of the play field faster. Like people aren't really excited about working on the underparts. Well, some of us are, but like um, getting on top of the play field is what really attracts people into designing games. Yeah, one of the frustrating points is like, you know, when you get your white wood going and all that, it's like trying to write a bunch of code just to see your flow shots are there and all that. Okay. You want to try to avoid all that. So it's like, just get the hardware in there, get it kind of flipping and, and kind of get all those shots down, then start worrying more about the code. Sorry, my voice is out day one already. I can't believe that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that's where like, you know, we developed a, 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 a pinball pro, or a fast pin protocol, we call it, like that is actually a, firm, a firmware level uh, communication protocol with the hardware itself. So you can actually like, with just a terminal command, like, you know, configure the hardware to, you know, flip flippers and, and pop pop bumpers and run delays and all sorts of things that let you, like Dave was saying, before you even write any high level code, just with like a terminal prompt, say I want this flipper to fire when the switch is pressed and I want it to hit this hard, you know. And so from a design and development standpoint, like, you know, if you're arranging your white wood, you're not necessarily thinking of like scoring and how much certain shots would be worth because you don't know how hard they are to hit or, you know, um, how it works into your game design overall, but you got to get those physics right. You know, this shot, this flipper needs to be this strong to hit this ramp shot and you start moving things around. So it our goal was really to get into it, into a natural design and development um, process. Um, but again, too, when, when Gabe shows up or if he doesn't and he comes see us upstairs, um, you can see where they were able to take their mission framework that has you know, all the, the core resources it takes to actually run and, and develop a game, uh, game software, um, how easily they were implementing that in with their hardware. In fact, we did like a whole rewrite of it like a week and a half ago, like, which actually reduced the, the need for a driver in between. So it's basically Python, in their case, talking directly to our hardware. So it simplifies um, actually how you interface with our hardware and, doesn't, and, and opens up more options as far as like where you can run it. You know, if your drivers, um, you know, when you're, when you're producing drivers that have to run on, you know, 64-bit Windows or Windows 10 or all these different versions, it's a whole other layer to manage. And so we wanted to, uh, one of our, our core goals was to make sure that it was very easy to get in and start programming pinball in whatever language you know. You know, don't force anybody down any certain tracks. And please, if you have any questions, too, during, during this whole thing, just ask any time. Yeah, we kind of get on a run and get yeah. excited about stuff and just say, hey, you know what, that was... Sounds interesting, but I don't know what you said. Like, it, it was a huge goal for us to try to become drivers like that because you know the whole thing with all the different platforms, like Aaron was mentioning a little bit, and everything else. It's like, you know, being able now just to go directly from um, Mission Pinball directly and like any new features we support and everything else without having to update any drivers. That means it's supported immediately. Even if Mission doesn't do it right away, it's like you have direct access to go, you know, do those drivers yourself right. and talk to them. So. And, and also too, like by making that layer so easy to work with, if you're developing like you're a .NET developer or, or like you know, you're writing stuff in Node.js or something and you want to develop your own driver for your experience with our hardware, you're basically de you know, setting up your own baseline resources for you to write your code. You don't have to create an interface to another interface to work with the hardware. So, you know, and again, it's all new and it's, it's kind of just starting to get out there, but the people that we've you know, consulted with and, and, and we've had suggestions and advice you know, over the last couple of years as we've been going to shows, we really try to take all that stuff to heart. You know, a lot of people made an effort to come out and said, we heard you're making new hardware, don't do this, or make sure you consider this, or I worked at Williams Valley years ago and this was something that you guys need to make sure you factor in. So we really like, you know, open arms to like all these suggestions and stuff, and we think we've come up with something that's, that's pretty compelling. Um, and one of the big things too that, um, that I, I think um, 
is important is that, you know, and I made the quote up here, let designers be designers, you know. The skill sets that it takes to, you know, design a game or do the art package for a game or do the build of a game and write code for a game, it's a very diverse set. You know, usually like most people meet have maybe two or three of them overlapping. Um, but a lot of people who have these great design ideas and concepts to, to make games don't ever get started because it's like, you know, where do I actually even start? And so, um, so we felt like by getting the hardware interface set up in a way that you could even like, you know, consult with a buddy or something like that and get the first game set up, by the time you go to your next one, it's just kind of adapting and changing things a little bit. It's not a massive rewrite every time you go from game to game. Um, so yeah. Um, next slide. What's this one say? Does it go again? Okay. Um, we wrote this like minutes ago. The slide deck that Gabe's bringing is like finishing up. So I'm like, hey, what are we talking about? Um, okay, so whoops, let's go back on this. So, um, so again, like one of the things that we're really proud of is like, from hardware wise, like if you if you started off with your one-off custom game, this hardware is not just designed for like tinkering. Like it's it's going to scale up to a commercial game. Like it's it's designed to be robust and 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 not be something that you you whip up your original design and then you, you know, someone wants to throw some money at it and actually produce it, um, and you have to start the whole process over again. Um, it was really designed to, to grow with you. you know? and you yeah, so I can talk that. a little bit about yeah. that. So yeah, you know, we made it very modular. So like all of the boards, like they just plug into this daisy chain, which we'll talk a little bit about. <clears throat> but what we try to do is make each board you know, really robust. So you know, like all of the digital inputs, we can handle up to 80 volts in there without damage. All of the drivers, we have like overcurrent limiting on there. So it's like we try to make each little piece, you know, kind of standalone, robust, so that you don't have to keep, you know, dinking around with it. There's no configuration on it. If you'd ever did have a bad board, whatever else, anything that's, you know, we only make three different driver boards. It's like if that one goes, just throw another one in there type thing. And, you know, switches and drivers to us, they all act the same way. So you can actually interchange the boards, like just move wires around and um, hook on to different drivers and be able to make simple changes in the software and then just move right along. So. Yeah, and, and um, one of the big uh, bits of feedback that we had on hardware too was people didn't want to be told what OS they had to write for and what language they had to write for. So, you know, right away plugging into the hardware, whether you use like the, we have a big and black interface on here, not just because that's the only way, but because it was a nice symmetrical, stable set of footings. So you can see the big and black right into it and it has the three separate URI connections for the serial connections right in it. Also passes the power up to it and some reset lines. So when you shut the game off, it can pass a signal up to tell your OS to shut down. Um, so that was a big deal. If, if, you're, if you're connecting from you know, a Raspberry Pi or something else, you can actually just do a USB connection and it, it shows up as like a, basically a three port hub and um, you, know, you can talk right to the virtual COM ports that are on there. Um, so again, the input part, people didn't want to be told what to do. And then on the toy end of things, like the making of the original features and things, that was a big deal. So we came up with this, um, we're just kind of calling it our daughter board interface right now. And so all the driver boards that we're passing around, you'll see that on the, on the left side of them, there's a standard left side. So now, no matter what the configuration is for the hardware on there, you've got that standard side. And it was intended so that you could actually build these little parts that add to the system. So instead of like, say somebody wants to make you an animatronic Rudy head that looks like some character, and they're wondering how many drivers do I get or what's your software setup or whatever. Instead, they just know, if they know the, the protocol and the, and the configuration and the settings and stuff like that that our system needs in a daughter board interface, they can design to that. And, and it's done. So when you plug that into our system, it shows up as extra data that you can interface with. And so that's gonna make the process of, of people making toys and new features really spread out. And hopefully it brings in like new people and uh, making new things. So this example right here, this was a, a, a servo motor controller. So it'll control uh, six different servo motors. And uh, this is one that like, I mean, literally just the last couple of days, like Dave put the finishing touches on that. And it's actually, I mean, it's, it's a great example of what you can do with, um, with our protocol engine when you're not bound by you know, how you actually integrate it within everything else. So um, yeah, you should talk about that a little bit, the, the commands and all that kind of stuff. It's, yeah, so it's like, right now we have like two boards that we've made. One of them extends, <clears throat> first off our partnering system, you'll see it on some more slides when we start uh, going over the individual boards, but it's pretty simple. The first two digits of all of our boards is how many switches it has and the next digits are how many drivers. So if I say 16, 16, that means it has 16 switches and 16 drivers. 0804, eight switches, four drivers. So it's kind of interesting, the way, as soon as you plug a board into the system, the very first board, if it has switches and drivers, it's gonna be switch number zero and driver number zero. 
if it only had like eight switches on that board, the next board you plug in, no matter what, it's gonna start at switch number eight. So everything as the system grows, it's like so do the numbers of resources and they're always in order starting from the controller. So we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we sit there and make toys right. integrate with all these things? Because a toy is not necessarily a switch, it's not necessarily a driver, right. it's something different. So we came up with this concept of extra data. And uh, we figured there's two different types. There's extra data in or an extra data out. Extra data in would be something like maybe you make an accelerometer and you want to see the XY coordinates from it. So we, we have a concept where you just sit there and tell the system, I'm making an accelerometer. I need, you know, three bytes or two bytes of on? input. Hey. <laughs> so he did make it. Right on, man. Welcome. <laughs> We're just talking about Pinball Harper. I just went from Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, there's this, it's a generic thing that we made. It's just called you know, data in, data out. And um, so the servo board, for instance, it has six drivers on it. So I need six bytes of data. It's like one byte for every single servo that I have. So byte zero would automatically become servo zero, et cetera. So um, anyway, if you were to make toys, the same thing. It's like you just would indicate how many ins and outs you need and, and go from there. And I, th I think one of, the, one of the key things that, that's excited about that is there's, you know, back to the whole different skill sets. You know, there's a lot of people out there creating some amazing stuff with just an Arduino by itself. You know, like what's the, what's the goal of this one little function, whether it's like some robot that follows the ball around the play field or like um, some other toy feature. It really says like, you know, you've got this skill set. I want to make this game. What if we kind of collaborated together and, and made something really cool? Because, I mean, that's, that's one of the best things about pinballs. It's, it's everything in a literal box from art and woodworking to electronics and software and all that stuff. So really, like, it brings people together. Um, let's see where we're at. So we were talking about the, the network boards and stuff and the daughter board interface. I think we kind of yeah, covered that one. Pretty much covered we, it. Actually, we did kind of glaze over one point. Um, we, we have different form factors for our board. Dave talked about how it's modular. It's also modular down to actually how the features and stuff like that get onto the hardware. So this is a new turn of, of the WPC board interface. So in the same way that you would program in this system when it's all networked and it tells you the switches and the drivers you have to work with, this interface abstracts away the fact that it's actually in a WPC cabinet. So when you plug that in there, it's returning back that you're pressing these switches, whether it's from a switch matrix or direct input switches, um, the drivers, all that, working with the existing displays. So if you had an existing WPC game and you had this piece of hardware, you plug that in there and you wrote game code to take over that game, you could theoretically take that game code and plug it on your new whitewood that had the same pieces and parts on it and the code would just run. So for someone who has access to a game like that, you're not forced to do a whole hardware build just to you know, take a stab at actually writing hardware. So we want to make sure that like, the, the protocol and the way that you communicate with the, with the games um, was universal and, and we, made, you know, we made every attempt to make it future proof. So if we decide to change the way the processors run, we find a new part that we think is really good that's more affordable or more efficient, we can change all that behind the scenes in future hardware iterations that doesn't you know, put your old code at risk if you want to adapt that going forward. So. Even in a production stand, if you wanted to sit there and put something else on besides the Beagle Bone Black, um, Aaron described a little earlier, we have the communication signals up there, we have the power, we got all the reset, all that type stuff. If you wanted to put your own processor on here and control this whole board, you could do that as well. So all those protocols are open, so whatever, whatever you're used to programming in, yeah. you can sit there and take over control of the entire you know, network and all the drivers. Yeah, should be fun. Okay, uh, next slide. What are, what are we saying next? Okay, so this was just a, a photo tour. We weren't quite sure what we were into for a presentation wise. So this is just showing off the core controller with the BeagleBone Black Linux PC actually seated directly into it. So this is, this is giving you like the HDMI out of the, the, um, the BeagleBone Black for using that for display. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's an entire like Linux PC seated, seated into that. Um, and it is the same board that's sitting in here, so you can take a look at it right. here as well. You can kind of see it all in the system. We don't have the BeagleBone Black on here, but you can see it's got that the standard Williams 5 volt, 12 volts in at the top. Um, the little connectors on the right hand side on that one bottom here are all the RGB outputs. Um, and then uh, the network connections are the RJ45s in the upper right hand corner there connected to the uh, white wires down here. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the, the, uh, the, the I.O. boards that we have. And like Dave was saying, it's the 1616, the 3208, and we can go to the next slide too. Um, it'll show the, uh, the 0804 and the 0804 with that daughter board you know, seated right into it. Um, and again, like, you know, other designers who've looked at this said, you know, I, I just want a case of those 0804 so I can sprinkle them all around the play field and make my game exactly how I want is like, almost like a sketch pad. And then when it gets down to actually, you know, I wanted to produce that game, obviously we can figure that in a way that was most you know, easier to build, fewer parts and stuff. But um, just trying to be flexible with how that goes. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so here's something we didn't go into quite yet. Like, um, we have a, um, a fuse block that we set up, and we were talking this idea while I was like cleaning the roof of my house. And I was like, Dave, you know, we're gonna have people in here messing with hardware that have never done it before. And we got like high voltage in here, and you can hurt yourself with that. So let's, let's, let's create something, some safety features to work in. And Dave's like, I got an idea for it. So what's cool about this one is you can see the two little indents between the fuses there. And actually, like when the fuses are good, they light up green. And when they blow out, it turns red. And it can handle up to like, what's it? 80. 80 volts of power through them. Um, well, what's cool is if that's sitting in your cabinet in there and you, something goes wrong, you open the door, you can see across the way that like that fuse blocks out or that fuse is blown. So it was just kind of some fun ways to create some, uh, some cool hardware that um, actually has, has an enable too that you can tie to like a coin door. So when it opens up at the hardware level alone, you can open that coin door and it'll kill the high voltage switch going through. And then also um, there's our RGB LEDs. And so what you see on the screen right here is the insert design where it's like um, part of you know, when you're using RGBs like and different LEDs, it's the cost of like, well, traditionally they're usually more money than regular LEDs. But what, what we tried to do with the design was go, well, what happens if we could take away the bracket that it takes to mount it? And if we could do that, and then you could say, I'm gonna use RGB for everything, even if I'm only ever using them for just white, um, then you're not having two separate controllers controlling your lights. It's all just the same controller, even if one just stays white the whole time. And so in, in this one here, um, we actually, oh, it's on this play field here, um, we, added on some, uh, some right angle adapters so you could use a standard like two by 3.1 uh, inch header and it was really stable and it came on really well. So being able to mix and match plugs and stuff was really cool. So this one and this whole play field, I don't know if Dave said that, we started this up like last Wednesday and it just had just the hardware with ponytails for the coil plugs um, and all this was just kind of wired up since then. Uh, next slide. Oh, and this is just showing again like the, the WPC interface board and this was the previous generation of that, we just got the new ones in here. We're actually building them up while we're hanging out in the booth. So if you've never seen the hardware under a microscope, like come check it out, it's pretty cool. Okay, next one. Okay, this is the coolest thing. So if you haven't seen this game yet up here, this is the first game that's been built up that has our hardware in there. And this has been super exciting. And over the last few weeks, um, you know, uh, Brian, who's not, uh, who also works with Mission, was actually in town with us. Uh, he couldn't be here this week. Um, and we were working with Brian Madden, or sorry, Brian Cox, who's doing the, uh, the Tattoo Mystique game in this very tight loop. I and mean, we were working in our new firmware layer. They were refining stuff in the Mission Pinball framework. He was getting his game dialed in. It was awesome. And so to see this game, I mean, I get a little tear in my eye going, there it is, you know, it's, it's, it's so slick. He did stuff with MPF that even we weren't sure we could do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 again, when you have like a designer, you know, challenging you, challenging the engineers, that's, that's good. And that's one of the things we really try to do. I mean, that's why when we met with Gabe and Brian with the mission software, it was like, you know, buddy, what's going on? Like, it, it's the idea of like collaborating and not saying, no, you can't do that. It's tell me why you want to do that. And if we can't propose a solution, what, we, what we've already accomplished, well, let's figure out a way to do that, you know? So we really want to engage. We, we don't want to, like, uh, stifle cool ideas. We want to find a way to enable that. And that's why we started with this new platform, was to say this is going to be the baseline that we build on going forward. So I think it's, I think you're up now. All right, so, how are we set up here? So right now we've got... Um, Where's this presentation running from? In the back. <laughs> okay. And then um, on here I've got, um, let's see, let me close this up. I've got the earlier version of this code that was on here, so I don't know how you want to run through it. Do you that was working the last time you used it, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Mostly, I think. It's a live demo. Um, I know, seriously. We can fix it on the fly. This game, this game config is actually not all that complicated, okay. so it's fun to, uh, at some point here, down we'll go through it. My name's Gabe, by the way. I'm the other guy behind Mission Pinball. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got a few slides just to talk about Mission Pinball, but then Hopefully we can get into this guy and get a demo going. Uh, I was working on stuff literally on the plane on the way here and it unraveled right as they said, close your laptops. So um, I'm like, what does unraveled mean? <laughs> I'm landing. It fell apart. I took the thread and the whole thing. Yeah, um, it was my own. I, I tried to get fancy and it just didn't pan out. <laughs> so um, anyway, so we can go to the next slide, I guess. Uh, yeah, so what's Mission Pinball all about? Um, we can keep going. Who am I talking to that's advancing? Oh, okay, anonymous guy in the back with the arm. Um, yeah, go ahead into the next slide then. Uh, so, oh man, this is a build, just tick, tick, tick. <laughs> so, all right, so basically, Mission Pinball Framework is about writing your own rules for pinball machines. And whether this is your own custom pinball machine that you're building from scratch, 
or whether that's re-theming a game, maybe you don't like the rules, maybe you like the game and just want to add to it, like uh, Cactus Canyon was redone, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that's what Mission Pinball Framework is about. Uh, for us, this is 100% free. We're just two guys that are, we have IT jobs for our day jobs, and we're not trying to sell anything. We just really want to make it easy to make custom pinball machines. And it goes back, I think you can probably go to the next. And it's a build. <laughs> um, so a few years ago, we decided to make our own custom machine. Once we learned that these different controller hardware pieces were out there, we thought, all right, cool, we're going to make this machine. And we got to the point where we had some flippers, and we had, you know, we had a lower third, and we wanted to smack the ball around up against the back. And we learned that it was pretty hard to actually do that based on what was available at the time. And so all the code that was out there would get you maybe 5 or 10% of the way in. But then you, as the game designer, were spending a lot of time setting up things that every pinball machine has, like a trough and, a, and pop bumpers and drop targets and things like that. And so we thought, all right, while we're writing the custom software or the software for this custom game, let's spend a little extra time with each one of these components and make it extensible, make it so that anybody can just use it. And so that's what we've done. Our goal here is to get you to maybe 85, 90% of the way to supporting any pinball machine. Um, so we already have features built in to support drop targets and troughs and things like that. And the rest of it, the, the stuff that makes a game unique, you can then focus on uh, on your own. That's the other 10%, 10 or 15%. The benefit, since we're IT guys, uh, our whole lives are spent with config files. And we thought, what better way to make it you know, easy to create a game than to use config files. And hopefully we'll find a way that I can show you that later. Maybe if it's on here, if you just come back to the booth, um, I can show you there too. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a configuration file that sets up this game. There's a section for ball devices, like your kickouts. Uh, there's a section for the trough. There's a section for targets, stand up, drop, and roll over. Uh, we have separate ones for the, each of those. We have separate sections for scoring and for light shows and, and DMD and LCD shows and stuff as well. But all of these are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. They're not self-explanatory, but we do have really good tutorials. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, this documentation, like, I, I, I suck at documentation. I look at this stuff and I'm just blown away. Like, it's very thorough. I'm kind of going, I don't even know what the script says behind me. I'm just going now. <laughs> Um, so so the, the bottom line is we tried to make it easy to do this. And we got it to the point now where Brian and I, all, you know, I, I'll be, we are the creators of it, so I guess we have an advantage. But we can take a machine from nothing to something, not everything, but something, in a couple of hours. Uh, and there's a, document, there's a series of blog posts documenting taking Demolition Man, taking out the WPC MPU, putting in a pinball controller, and then starting from scratch and writing code for it. And because we've already done all the work of setting up these sort of general devices, all we have to do is turn those on, tell, it, tell the game where they're plugged in, and away we go. And so it's a half an hour here, 45 minutes there. But really, you spend an hour writing a config file, and your game's going to do something. Um, now, recreating Demolition Man, that's a separate thing altogether. That's where it takes time and planning and basically reverse engineering what Williams did in the first place, but it's better than writing an assembler. <laughs> the whole thing's based on Python, by the way, and we've, we've done this to, to make a fully custom game. You'll have to dig into Python a tiny little bit, but it's a very small little corner of Python that we've sort of exposed through Mission Pinball Framework, so you don't have to be a Python developer. All of the examples and stuff that we post online, like those are almost cut and paste. Just tweak it a little bit uh, for your specific game. Um, so it's written in Python, but you don't have to be a programmer or specifically a Python person at all. Um, go ahead and next. Hey, Gabe, uh, real quick, we have a question from our online audience. Oh, we have an online audience. We do. We do. <laughs> yeah, we encourage do. them to ask questions. So, sure. A uh, person writes, uh, I'm working on a project for an existing Stern machine to play video sequences from a movie. Okay. I don't want to use MPEG-1 files. Is there a better way using the BCP to use MPEG-4 or another compressed format to simply play movie scenes while still overlaying the score? <laughs> this that's, person that's, has that's read a, Yeah, exactly. That's a advanced <laughs> level question. There is a way to do that. So, so currently, 
um, out of the box Mission Pinball Framework supports MPEG-1 videos and it's based on the plugins and how we had to put the whole thing together. Um, we can support more modern video protocols and in fact we can support full on 3D graphics rendering with uh, through this BCP protocol that he mentioned. Um, that's way more complicated than I wanted to get into here but the uh, answer to that question is yes we can do that. Um, it requires way more work and uh, it's not it, it's something that you'd be taking on in addition to building the game out with MPF for now there's a couple of people that are working on something called a unity engine which is this it's basically for 3d games what MPF aims to be for pinball where people can create fully immersive 3d environments and as part of that you can run MPEG 4 videos but you're kind of at the mercy of BCP is only like two weeks old <laughs> so uh, yes good luck with that <laughs> um, all right, so I already mentioned here that we can use MPF to rewrite the rules for existing games. And again, it is not like we can just put in this, you know, put in a fast board and put MPF on a host and tweak the rules of an existing game. Like we'd have to start from scratch, but you can make, say, a not so awesome game pretty awesome. Um, and I think that we are done with these, uh, these bullet points here. So like I said, there's hundreds of pages of documentations and how to. There's literally a 19 step that'll process that'll take you from nothing to flipping with scores and combos and all of those things. And you can do that in maybe a couple of evenings uh, if you wanted to try it yourself at home. And the demo. So uh, ordinarily, I'd be yeah, scrolling can... through a config file here. So maybe we let's can put we get this, this up, down. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to have quite the same. Did you bring a ball too? Uh, where's the? Where's it? So you want to see well, the config files itself? Okay. Do we have a mouse? What? Yeah, the? I know this crazy that? robot thing. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, there will be no coding, not with this keyboard. There's actually another keyboard. Oh, right great. Over here. So, so I had it's, some config files and stuff big. up here from earlier that we were messing with. Okay. Cool. Um, so this, this game, like I said, is actually pretty simple. So this. the entire game, is this our mouse then? Is yeah. that what this is? I wonder if we can, yeah. can we do like, does that make things bigger? <laughs> kind of. So tough to see, but this is our config file for this game. And in this config file, All right, is there a down key here? Yeah. So in this configuration file, we're, we're just specifying, we're saying how many balls this machine has, we're saying what platform this thing runs on, because it doesn't just run on fast, it runs on anything out there. And if you happen to be making your own pinball controller, we can support that too. Uh, in fact, there's two or three active development things where guys are just, they, 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 they're having more fun making the boards than they are mm -hmm. making the game, and so they just wanted to make their own hardware, and so they're tweaking it to work with, uh, with, with our platform too, or tweaking our platform to work with their boards. Um, we specify how we communicate, so with the fast boards, they should do the BeagleBone Black plugged in. That just uses basically USB, except there's no USB connectors with the BeagleBone Black. In this machine, we're using a PC, right? So it's right. just plugged in with USB, and so we specify what ports we're actually using with that. And then, uh, this is really weird. Oh, I see, it's our zoom that's messing us up here. Um, so we can also, that, and this is where we start to specify our rules too. So we're saying how many balls we have in a game. Uh, and then we're starting to specify our hardware. So what we're seeing right here, which is really tough because it's pink, is our switch definitions. And so we're actually going in and naming a switch, and we call it some name that we, that's meaningful to us. And we can tag a switch with certain things. So we, we, we can tag it with uh, points please, for example, here. And so every time we tag a switch and we hit a switch, it posts that tag and we can do whatever we want with that. The tags are actually really easy to use in this. So we specify our switch name, the number that it is. With, uh, with, with the fast driver boards, that's a letter or a number. With, uh, if you're using the WPC controller with WPC driver boards, those are gonna be the same WPC number that's in your switch matrix. 
And actually, I should say too, like with, with our hardware itself, there's a set of commands that you can run. So when you first connect the hardware, you need to identify what all your coil numbers are and your switch numbers and things. So we have some commands you can just actually pull up a query command and scroll through it. And, and, and as you're touching switches, it's giving you which switch number it is. So you can write your config kind of as you're going. But even for the coils and stuff too, you plug those in, you can scroll through and, and it'll start flipping each, it'll start firing each of the coils. And you can identify those in the process. And just the last couple of days, Dave did the same thing with the RGB LEDs as well. So you can scroll through those and say, this is this one, this is this one. And we needed that after we spent like half an hour IDing them all <laughs> over the game. Which one is that? And then finding a name for it. So um, those kind of commands make the process of setting up the configs like really easy too. And uh, frankly, I've used that on WPC machines with the fast hardware, just because, I don't know if you've noticed, but the manuals aren't always right yeah. uh, in terms of what goes where. So same thing here for our coils. We're specifying our coils. Again, it's just a coil number. And also, in this situation, we're specifying its pulse time. And so here we can do uh, regular coil pulse. We can tell it uh, whether to use patter or not. And so we can support uh, any generation of pinball machine uh, and, and any, what do I want to say, any way, any way that a coil is wired up. Right. Uh, and then same exact thing for lights. I mean, we're specifying a light name, we give a light a number, and then we can tag a light. So for this game, uh, this game's interesting. I don't know if you saw before, there's a dartboard on here, and there's a lamp underneath the red and the black settings. And so we have lights tagged with red and black. So later, we can actually write the code, I'm sorry, we can write the config file that says, turn on the red lights only. And all we have to do is say, turn on lights tagged with red. That's, it's a one line thing that makes all the lights in the red segments turn on. Uh, and so we can do complicated shows that way with just a couple of lines. Turn them on, turn them off, turn on the black, turn off the red, that sort of thing. How does this thing have black lights? I think he's, he's referring to the, the, the dark, just dark boards. Oh, okay. It was late, it drank like a lot of Cokes, <laughs> yeah. and we're like, we need a naming convention here. Let's go black and red. There you go. The show that I wrote on the plane is not going to be nearly as impressive, knowing now that... <laughs> well, we can go up there and tweak it upstairs. We're going to like, be writing up game code as we're going through the weekend here, so it'll evolve over the, over the next day or two here. Yeah, I should say, this thing is very basic. So we, we haven't really done added any real pizzazz to this game, and that's what we're going to work on over the weekend. So if you have suggestions, stop by. Make, make this do this, you know? We can put it on the list and see if we can get to it, you know? We took a, um, a 1974 Gottlieb Big Shot to <laughs> the Chicago Pinball Expo, and we took out the guts of that game in a very nice way and donated them to somebody who really wanted uh, more guts to an, an EM. And we, play, uh, we replaced it with driver boards and modern stuff, and we rewrote Big Shot, which was like 10 minutes, because it was Big Shot, and it's not that hard. Hit down the side light special, done. And, uh, <laughs> but in addition to that, we were able to, do you know what a track mode on Big Shot looked like? The game over light blinked on and off. That was a track <laughs> mode. And so for us, we, we, we had every single light was addressable. And so now we can say, make all the lights sneak around here. And there was a, there was a really cool pool rack on the play field. And so we could make that sneak around the lights and flash them in different ways and sweep when you hit different sides. And we just put a time machine switch on the front so you could flip it into old and new mode. And that's the kind of thing we're going to add to this. So we'll add scoring and cool light shows and sounds and stuff. Um, so that's all of our light specifications. This is all, this is all just a, I don't know, hour and a half worth of work maybe to get all this stuff set up. And a lot of that is just discovery. And here we also configure our flippers, which I don't know how to get up there Maybe this way. Not that anybody can see it anyway. But here we actually have flipper definitions. So we're specifying the left flipper, and then we're saying which coil a left flipper is by its name, and then which switch it is. So this is tying, this configuration section here is tying this coil to this switch. And that's it. So you specify that flipper, and when you fire this game on, now when you hit that button, the flipper flips. It's two lines. And then we get into the stuff that makes it even more modern. So in, in this part of the config file, we're actually specifying our LCD uh, functionality. So when we start this game, there's actually a window that appears here. And that's why these guys put this LCD in the back box is because now we can make that show anything. We can make that show the, old, the original back box image. We can make that thing put a virtual DMD here so we don't have to have a physical DMD. We can have it, our, our goal was WAS. Our goal was to get to the kind of functionality or the kind of views that you would get if you were playing Wizard of Oz. We're not there yet, but we're working on that. Um, and that's sort of what that BCP question was about. He wanted to play different videos, and right. along with that comes more modern features. 
but it's still our goal with just basic Mission Pinball Framework config files to get a certain level of, um, what did I say, a modern look. Yeah. So here we're specifying what that LCD window looks like, but we also have the ability to have a physical DMD. Uh, and so a lot of work has gone into the physical DMD. We don't actually have to make these DMD image files or DMD files anymore. We can just type in a text string, say what font we want it to be, and it'll render that font. Now it's a lot more complicated than that, but we put a lot of effort into making it easier to do DMD animations in text. And then the last section here is uh, some light shows. So we have an attract mode show that, uh, actually I have no idea what it does, Brian and these guys set it up last week, so I'll be as surprised as you when we turn it on. Um, and so, I, I mean, I see here, we, ha we named a show Green 301 Ring Spin. So one of these rings, yeah, turn place, that one it's on. gonna spin around. Yeah, yeah we can start up. it, like, we're ready to go, because I'm gonna be in the config file anyway. Sweet. Uh, can we unzoom? How do I do that? Let's go with this. There we go. All right, so. I, I only write about IT. I don't actually do IT. <laughs> so I, I don't know how I did that. Uh, okay, so let's see. Do you want this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, it's a, it's a, I mean, it was one. fun watching you try. Yeah, th th thanks, man. Uh, now okay. I can sit here. <laughs> All right. Um, Look again. Oops. Come on, man. <laughs> We're trying to do a presentation. People are online right now. We have them laughing. Okay. I didn't do that. Uh, all right. So I think I can go MPF. I can type. Um, what's this game? You yeah. want to tell them what this is going to do? Bullseye dash C. What's dash C do? What are that one? Fast. Yeah. Oh, no, you, you keep going. So it's bullseye dash C space fast. And then just in case it crashes, let's put it, let's add some logging. So space dash V, capital V, another cap, another V. That? That'll work. Okay. Or See, that's not. not that's not the way I ran it before. Let me do it the way I did it before. Did you create your own batch file? No, the, uh, Brian made it. Yeah, he made a new one. Okay. Uh, so here we go. So, so here's our virtual VMD. Over there. This thing is... Uh, it, it, this is actually so much work. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, but so, so we can have the virtual DMD to just show us what our game's gonna look like. A lot of people that have, that have been using MPF aren't using it on a physical machine. Right. They're downloading MPF, they're writing game rules there, and they're, they're building their configs and their animations without actually having a physical machine because we can make any switch in this game respond to just a keystroke. So you can tie in the left flipper switch to you know the the, the left shift key if you want to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks are doing this sort of virtually right now. Um, I like having a machine, so I've been working on mine. You know, one of the things I was going to say too, like you know, if you've never programmed a pinball machine before, like one of the raddest things I found about the Mission Framework is that it it takes care of all the things you didn't know you had to actually do. You know, all the 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 utility stuff that pinball machines, you know, player management, scoring, like all these things. Like the idea of making stuff move around and, and get points when it hits things is that's pretty simple. But all the sophisticated stuff that happens underneath a game that um, you know, a lot of people who, who whip up a quick game, that's the 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 fit finish you have to go back and do later. That's taken care of right out, right, right out the gate. Right, making a machine flip is one thing. Yeah. Making it keep score for four or more players. Right. Um, keeping track of where the ball is. Holy cow! The ball controller. We have ripped apart the ball controller four or five times in the past. If you go all the way back to when we first started doing the custom machine before we. Just, conceived MPF. We did it three times before we got to MPF. And we did it one more time when we had Big Shot, which was a 40-year-old machine, and we realized it doesn't work the same way. Um, you know, but nowadays there's plunger lane switches, although not on this machine. This one does that one. <laughs> so, um, but there's, there's things that we took for granted that weren't there. So we had to build more intelligence in. And we haven't had to change the ball controller in probably six or eight months, so we're good now. But uh, it's, been, it's been a challenge to make this thing actually, to, to make pinball machines actually behave the way that we expect them to. Yeah, and like I said, like the, the documentation they've got on their site is, is amazing. I mean, I, I, I read it over my lunch. New sections come in all the time, just learning about all the things that it takes to go in and actually build a machine. So, you know, we've been working on the hardware for so long that it's like, you know, when you're working on something to be able, you're building and designing something to build and design something, it's, you're, you're kind of a couple steps removed. But in the last few weeks, it's been like, you know, seeing how mature the framework is getting, the hardware being done, putting it together, it's like, now I want to build again. 
And so like seeing all these resources that were designed to say, get me to actually designing, um, it's exciting. And I think that, you know, what we'll see, you know, in the coming days as, as we get hardware into people's hands is like, you know, hopefully more games like Tattoo Mystique upstairs and see like, you know, what new ideas come in that aren't already in pinball. Stuff, you know, ideas from other industries, other businesses and stuff like, you know, artists and uh, game designers who are not pinball game designers are probably the two groups that I've experienced that are most excited. Like, people come to the pinball shows because they love the pinball culture and the design and, and the, the tradition and stuff, but never thought they could make a game. And when they can see, you know, how quickly some of the stuff can get con configured and, and brought to life, you're much more inclined to treat, you know, the pinball machine like a canvas and, and bring your art into it. And then game designers too, our goal with the hardware and like with a framework like this is to make it like a, you know, just any other software API that you use. Like don't make it into something you need to invent just to write a game. And so then it's more enticing for people who love the physical tradition of something you know, real and takes up space in your house, not just code software. So. And that was our thing. I mean, we're IT people, we like woodworking and we always liked mechanical things. And so what better way <laughs> to put all those things together oh, in yeah. one package? One, one very hard package to move into your basement. Um, so the, all that we have right here are a couple of light shows right now. Um, there's no scoring set up on this game yet, and that's one of the things that we're going to add over the weekend, which is, um, it, it's, it's not a big deal. I figure yeah. we'll probably do that tonight over yeah. beers or something. But, Sweet. Um, what these guys have done, they put our, those RGB LEDs under each one of these. So you know, when this game was original, it just had incandescence, and so the lights were the color that they were. Did you guys, you didn't redo this and put in clears, right? It just happened. No, this to one actually happened to you. That's yeah. why we chose it. Dave had it, and it was, he's like, it's got clears in it. So we were able to actually take advantage of the fact that it already had some clear LEDs in there. Um, and then, um, yeah, just in the last couple of days, I started adding, I had some RGB uh, GI type lights. So we went through and worked some of those in too. So um, just like you saw like in the config, you, you, you saw it was up there. Um, going through and naming all those things, there was a large section of the GI light that was commented out because we hadn't actually put the lights in yet. So we can go upstairs and map all those out and use, use Dave's new RGB uh, scrolling querying command to just go through and get the IDs for each one, write them into the config, and then we can control the lighting. So we can, we can bring it up nice and cool, heat it up, move the dynamics of the game around so we can say like, you know, if the ball is up here bouncing around the pop bumpers, maybe the light is warming up up here. It's going from a cool light to, to yellows, to greens, to, to reds, to, you know, like showing that there's game dynamics and game, uh, you know, scoring and stuff like that that may be based on time. So it heats up for a while and while it's still warm, you can go make some other shots and if it cools off again, then maybe that mode is over, you know? You're writing some awfully big checks. Dude, I know, that sounds awesome though, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated with the lighting, like creating moods, setting a stage, you know, so. Uh, we, we can see what we can work in. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, that's, I'm looking forward to doing that this weekend. I think that it's fun to uh, take a machine like this. I don't even know the rules to this game, which is awesome because I don't, I don't have any preconceived notions. Uh, so I, you know, we, we can just make up our own rules for this game. They only sold 150, and there's a reason why. And it wasn't you, very much fun to play. And you so. took it all apart? It sounds like it's a collector's item. There you go. Uh, <laughs> no, there's a reason. So, I mean, the, the fact that these, uh, when, once we're done, you guys can get up and come and check it out. But, I mean, the lights are going around. They're changing colors as they go. Um, and we can, with a couple of clicks in a configuration file, change everything about these light shows. Right. Um, Right now, we're just alternating certain things on this dartboard here. We can make it chase each other around. We can make it where there's a game that you play, yep. like a snake game. That's what we always wanted to do with the pool rack on Big Shot was it has 15 balls. Every ball in the rack has a light underneath it. And we thought it would be cool to turn it into like that Nibbles snake game where the snake chases something around and then gets bigger every time it eats something. It's only 15 lights, so it would be, be a short fun. game. Yeah, it would be, it would not <laughs> be a game, But nobody likes video modes anyway, right? Well, again, like all the lighting stuff that's in here is all a config file. Like, you know, we were in the shop last week and Brian was in town and I'm like racing to get it all wired up with the LEDs and stuff. I go, hey, it's done. He's like, well, I, I wrote the code for it like an hour ago. So it just turned on and spinning around, you know? So <laughs> you, 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 can, you know what you're doing just based on like how everything's named and where everything's at. So you can write it out knowing this is going to be changing colors. So I mean, to just plug it in and see it come on was like, it was awesome. It's, it's, it's really fun. The future for us, too, is, is, is Mission Pinball is that, you know, uh, we understand that this is still a big text file. And by the time you have a game complete, it's a bigger text file. And it's easy enough to follow because things are broken up into sections and you can break them up into files if you want. But some people are just more comfortable with a GUI. Uh, yeah. And so that's next on our plate probably in the next year or so is we're going to make a GUI configurator. I don't know. We'll come up with a better word. Um, and in that, we can also do config file validation so that it, you know, we, we don't have to worry about syntax or anything like that or typing in you know, typos, that sort of a thing. Um, we'll also make a way to visualize the lights. We actually have the ability to specify where on the play field a light is. So we can 
tell the light show to just start in the lower left corner and sweep all the lights up to the upper right corner um, or you know any combination thereof. And so we can do things that would take many, 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 many lines and a lot of planning automatically. Uh, I think we can do that today. If not, it's in the next uh, Yeah, the XY coordinates. Yeah. yeah. He started yeah. to put those in. Yep. You know, and, and also when, you, you know, when Brent, or Gabe's talking about the, um, the GUI end of things, you know, from the hardware side, we've put in a lot of commands and stuff that let you actually query the configurations of the hardware and stuff. So like if you want to actually like be able to, you know, see what all the switches are configured, if you have an interface that says, what are my switch configurations, it can read them back to you and say, here's what everything's configured like. So if you're going through and setting all your coil strengths and you're like, you read that back and it reads it into some GUI interface and says, this one's actually currently configured at 35 milliseconds and you raise that or lower that to make it what you want. Um, we expose a lot of that data to make it easy to pull so people can build utilities and stuff like that from like a, a GUI interface and stuff as well. So it's not just like, you know, a bunch of manual like hardware settings. We've tried to make it as elegant as we could. And also to let you know, like certain things, like there's a watchdog that we put in there. So if the watchdog times out, mm -hmm. none of the drivers are going to drive anymore. So if you go to the driver screen, the very first line says whether the watchdog is running, how much time is left right. on it. So just simple things like that that really help you diagnose your problems when you run into them. Yeah. We also set the <clears throat> default coil pulse time to like 10 milliseconds because if you don't and you specify something that's wildly more powerful than you need, it'll shoot your ball out and make a dent in your ceiling. Yeah. I've so knocked some balls that. across the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, are there any questions? We've rattled off a lot of really, we think, pretty fun stuff. But um, I mean, is anyone working on games or running the challenges? I wonder if this would actually even work for their idea. Anything? I have a question. What do you got? Uh, switches. Um, hooking up an optical switch to your hardware. What else does it need besides just the opto and the switch? You have to, so right now all of the switches were biased to 12 volts, so, and all switches are grounded, so we already kind of put on a little bit of bias on there. You still have to power up the other side, like whatever your LED is driving with, right? But yeah, so it'll already work with, you know, um, Hall effects, uh, optical, you know, regular switches. Nice. That bias will really help you out. When you go to knock down 12 volts to drive a opto to, like, that's, that's when you realize why they have those opto boards with you know 20 re 20 giant half watt resistors on them yeah so we tried that with quarters it also did not work <laughs> <laughs> it did once <laughs> and one thing nice too is like all the switches for instance each one has got a separate uh, debounce time for both open and close so if you got that slingshot effect going on where you know the slingshot is fired the rubber bands come and hit the switch you can sit there and program those a lot more aggressive on ignoring you know the, the bounce and you can also do some things at the driver level as well so it kind of makes it really universal to have you know individual mm -hmm. control over all that flippers you want to be very aggressive you don't want to wait like you know 40 milliseconds before you know you start to fire the flipper so you set those just to a couple but yes yeah, slingshots are notorious for getting that uh, shotgunning going on so you can completely stop that with a few parameters imagine too because you don't have that kind of resolution into the configuration of the device is not regular pinball machine, right? So now you can sort of extend the life of certain things or, you know, you don't want to take it all apart to get to this one thing where you have to adjust a switch or something like that. So you can just make a little tweak in code to change how fast that switch reacts to a closure. Um, and I mean, it is literally one line that does everything. It's two characters. Well, I was going to say too, like one of the things, and, and Dave touched on a little bit, is like the concepts of like, you know, debalance times and stuff like how reactive a switch is and when it actually, you know, it's it determined it's actually been pressed versus just shaking a little bit. Um, all that has been worked into how our hardware runs. And so we've got default configurations that we think are optimal for like reading the types of switches that are in games. But um, you can actually go in and dial that stuff in very specifically. So I'm pretty sure that in um, the Tattoo Mystique game upstairs, um, Brian had gone through and, and tweaked the way that the pop bumpers reacted so that they had the feel of the era that the game was designed to model around so that you know, not everything was you know, firing really hard and really fast. Um, it was designed to kind of have that like, little softer hit. You know? so, a little bit longer delay, yeah. a little bit weaker of a hit. Yeah. And when I first heard he was doing that, I was like, what are you even talking about? But then you start, you start you know, learning about like, the eras and the way hardware ran and, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. So I mean, w and I think that's one of the cool things about like, the kind of control that we work way down. You know? You know, you've got, even in the mission framework, it's got its defaults, we've got our defaults, but we're not saying that's our way or the highway. Like, go through and configure it exactly the way you want so your game feels the way that you want. And um, I think that's what's, what's um, I guess, probably, uh, it's, you know, the more time you spend making a game, the more, uh, the, the more you kind of develop your own feel and your own experience and stuff. And you, you have your own, then, defaults that you start with. So the next game you go work with, you, your, your choice and your preferences for how your games feel are 
built in by default. Whether you have more aggressive flippers because you got a bunch of ramps and stuff like that. Maybe you've got your, your ramp game configuration and then your classic ballet style like 42 inch play field configurations and stuff. So it's designed, I mean, from all angles to make the process of starting up a new game, you know, you're not starting from scratch every time, so. Any other question any from the online audience? Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, online person is asking uh, the availability and cost and will there possibly any be any type of modular, uh, you know, tiers to what you buy? You can download it today and it's free. I'm out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so the, the hardware itself, like, we've got an interest list of people that we need to kind of parse through and make sure they get a chance to buy. Um, the co controllers and stuff we have now, um, who set the price on those? Um, yeah, we'd have to go back. I, I, we, have, I, we have it all figured yeah. out. Booth so to talk to us. we've got a couple kits, though, that we put together that we're like, um, and I do know that. So if you were taking, like, um, a controller, and 13208 and the fuse block, and I think it was like a handful of LEDs. Um, this is basically all that you need to get your lower third set up and a little bit more. So the price we were shooting for for this was gonna be like 399. And so that was everything that it took to actually get that whole lower third started and, and running. And then there were some other packages and stuff like that that we were working from based on kind of the popular configurations that um, people have asked for, you know. But again, because it's all modular, like you can keep adding and mixing uh, and different boards as you go along. So that kind of starter kit we set at like the 399 price. And availability, um, depending on how many of these, we've actually sort of, we didn't pre-sell because that's bad in pinball. Um, <laughs> so based on the interest, like, you know, out, out of all the people that have waited, I mean, some, some cases like two years they've been waiting for us to get hardware done. Um, I got to go through all those people first to make sure they get their first chance to buy. But um, from this first batch that we ran, we we're actually able to get them produced in Seattle here. So um, we were getting all the price points and stuff down so that we ran that first batch and the controllers were the shortest amount. We have a lot of the rest of them. So um, we're gonna end up running another set of these, um, hopefully to meet demand. And we have actually fuse blocks available yeah. today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like the only thing fuse that doesn't need software in there. So fuse yes. blocks and LEDs are available. Yes. We've actually been selling the LEDs for a while to test out our web store and stuff. So um, people have been using those in different games. It doesn't just need to 